Hello and welcome to Who Wore It Better, where we review Raw and SmackDown back to back and try and figure out which show won for the week. Survivor Series is in the rear view. Let's see how each show followed up. Raw opens up with Stephanie McMahon, and you know, last week on Who Wore It Better, I said every episode of Raw should start this way. I think they're finally reading my letters, guys. She intros Triple H, who comes out, but before he can say anything, Kurt Angle interrupts and says he wants a piece of Triple H. Then out comes Jason Jordan, then out comes Braun Strowman. All three guys want to fight Triple H over what happened on Sunday night in 2017. It's absolutely ludicrous to think that, that, that Triple H is still such a focal point at this point in the game, but, you know, be that as it may, the crowd in Houston ate it up. They all wanted to see this happen. They all wanted to see somebody fight Triple H as a result of what happened on Sunday, and in a way, I did too. Like I said, I think the natural way this is going, it's very clear the path is going to be Triple H and Angle at WrestleMania, but now how are we going to bridge that gap? How are we going to go from point A to point B? Braun Strowman seems the most likely choice, but when are they going to pull the trigger on that? Who really knows? And I don't, you know, it's like, it sucks because that match is inevitably, is inevitably going to happen. I just, it's going to suck because I don't think Braun should really be losing to Triple H uh, at this point. The way they've been building him up, he really should be the guy to just destroy Triple H, which, you know, give Triple H credit over the last several years, he has been willing to put guys over. And so I think hopefully we'll get to see that. But Triple H, at the, on the other hand, needs momentum going into his thing with Kurt Angle. So how are they going to reconcile all that? The first match of the night is a rematch from a couple of weeks ago when there was a big pull-apart brawl and a double countout. It's Finn Balor versus Samoa Joe. Joe goes over clean as a whistle with the Coquina Clutch after a very good match between the two. Uh, you know, Obviously, this feud is not over yet. We're going to see more rematches down the line, and the Finn and Joe are going to be trading wins as they are want to do. My only question is, you know, what's going to be the blow-off? When is it going to be? And then what happens to both guys after it's all over? Asuka taking on Dana Brooke. When did Dana Brooke become a heel again? I'm very confused by that because you know, she became a face after she split from Charlotte several months ago, and then she was taken off TV for a while to, to train for the Arnold Classic. Then she comes back, doesn't really do much, she's just kind of in the background again. Then uh, her boyfriend passes away, so she's off TV again. And then she comes back and she immediately starts healing on Asuka. And so I don't know if they decided, well, the face run's not working, or they, decided, they just forgot that she was a baby face and turned her heel again. Who knows for sure? Either way, you know the outcome here. Asuka murders Dana Brooke. Up next, it's Miz TV. It's advertised that Roman Reigns is going to be the guest, but instead the entire Shield come out. Uh, the Miz wants to be thanked for helping essentially bring the Shield back together. First, he helped reunite Seth and Dean, and then he did the same with adding Roman to it. I'm curious, was that by design or total coincidence? Uh, the fans chant, thank you, Miz. They chant, Miz is awesome, and they chant, you're ungrateful toward the Shield. Houston is just really throwing a lot of very unique chants in this show. Miz gets angry at the Shield's insolence and lack of thanking them. The lights go out for a couple seconds seconds for some reason, just a lighting botch happens. And then uh, Roman says he wants the IC title and the fans are frothing at the mouth over this. They are going nuts over the idea of Roman fighting Miz for the IC title. And it's just so weird because ever since he's been back since his illness, he has been just very well received, I think, overall by the fans. There's still some booing here and there, but it's been overwhelmingly positive in my observation of it. I wonder if this reunion has helped finally have him turn the corner as a baby face or finally kind of like treating him the way he used to be before the breakup. And it it, it was a working formula then, and they figured, you know, lightning can strike twice, and I think it is finally paying off here. We'll see what happens in the weeks to come, but I mean, right now, this experiment seems to be paying off. Uh, so Bo says, if you want to get to the, to the Miz, you have to go through us. So the Shield beats up, you know, the Miz Taraj. Uh, Curtis looks so meek and helpless once Bo and Miz are out of the ring, and they beat Curtis up. And I guess Bo's uh, line was legally binding, because now there's going to be a match later in the night where Roman faces the Miz for the IC title. We then transition to a singles match between Dean Ambrose and Sheamus. At one point in the match, Ambrose is selling it to says, ow, to sell something. And the commentators have a good laugh at that. And Booker T actually says, that's when you know it really hurts. Like, maybe that could be interpreted as like it hurting more than normal. Like, it hurts all the time, and that one just really hurts more. Or you're just saying they're not really hurting each other, and it's all work. Ambrose wins the 30 deeds after Seth runs in and out of the ring to just dive onto Cesaro for just reasons. And so the faces come out on top of that segment. Then we go backstage, where Jason Jordan is asking Matt Hardy for advice, because um, Jordan, at the top of the show, was booked in a match against Braun Strowman, which is happening later. So then Matt cuts, it basically, it's like this line was clearly not written by him. Like it's the most like, you know, obviously things are very tightly scripted, meticulously written for the wrestlers here on this show. But when Matt reads it, it just sounds like, it looks like you could see his eyes looking off. It looks like he's looking at cue cards to read these obviously scripted lines toward Jason. Like this whole monologue where Jason just stands there and looks at him. I don't know why this one stuck out to me in particular. I think just Matt's delivery was so like, so wooden. In my opinion, I think 
think if he did it in the broken accent, it would have been over like gangbusters. Alexa Bliss comes out and she's looking pretty glum about her loss to Charlotte on Sunday. Mickey James interrupts her and calls her a biscuit butt, tries to get the chant going for biscuit butt, but oddly enough, it does not take as well as you're ungrateful. Mickey James challenges her for another title match, then Bailey interrupts and wants the title, then Sasha does the same thing, so does Alicia Fox. So uh, Angle comes out and makes a fatal four way for the number one contendership right now. So you've got Bailey, Sasha, Alicia, and Mickey all fighting. And then a couple of minutes in, well, first of all, I will say, just from a kayfabe perspective, why is Asuka not involved in this, you know, number one contendership scene? I mean, in a minute, we'll find out why. But just, you know, from a storyline perspective, Asuka, you know, she won the Survivor Series women's match all by herself, essentially. So shouldn't she be rewarded in, in that regard for a title match? Anyway, that's all kind of thrown out the window because in a few minutes in, Paige returns. Paige, after being gone for more than a year off TV, after all the madness behind the scenes with, you know, the suspensions and the neck injury and the Alberta Del Rio fiasco, she's finally back on TV. She cuts a promo where she deliberately asks the crowd to cheer more for her. And then she introduces Sonya Deville and Mandy Rose from NXT. And the new ladies beat up the current ladies. And then backstage, you see them do the same thing uh, with Alexa Bliss. And it's really cool. I mean, it's really awesome to see Paige back. I think she was kind of like, she was a character that really just stood out from everybody else at the time when she was active before. And now that she's back in there, I think uh, her presence will be, I think, uh, much needed. And it really kind of helps shake things up. Uh, although I did think it was funny that, you know, just in my Survivor Series review, I said, I, I did say that the Raw Women's Division was large and generally underused. So now let's throw three new women into the scene. We've got Paige, Sonya Deville, and Mandy Rose. And Sonya Deville and Mandy being called up is questionable. And I'll talk about the broader issue with Raw and SmackDown and the call-ups this week. But I think of all the people to be called up, all the women to be called up, Sonya and Mandy would not be my first choices. The fact that they kind of had them leapfrogging the iconic duo seems a little misplaced. I think that Sonya and Mandy, you know, I haven't seen Mandy wrestle at all on television. I talked to R. Felix Finch about it, and he said she's only been on TV twice, and the last time was eons ago. So to have them called up in that regard, I think was a little... Uh, early a little premature. Now, obviously, these two will be learning on the job, but I mean, it is still refreshing to see this like new heel stable come in of just the ladies coming in and kicking ass and taking names. And there's a mirror image of that happening on SmackDown, which I'll get to when we go to the SmackDown side of things. Up next, Jason Jordan taking on Braun Strowman. Now, in the preceding segments before this match, we saw a lot of like heel turn alert, heel turn alert coming for Jason Jordan because he's starting to play off the fact that he, he told Kurt, I, mean, I was lying earlier. My knee's not at 100%. I'm still hurt. You should cancel the match for me. And just trying to pull off the whole nepotism and then trying to use his alliance with Kurt Angle as a way to get out of things. Still trying to put himself over as a competitor, but it's a, you know, honestly, I'm still hurt. It, it's very shades of when Kurt was debuting in 99 and he was kind of like the goofy heel. Like he thought he was a baby face, but really he was, you know, he was doing heelish things. We're not quite that level yet and Jason doesn't have quite the charisma of Kurt Angle doing that, but I think it's a step in the right direction and like that's kind of what I was figuring was going to happen after last week and his whole thing where he was trying to like appeal to Kurt's uh, paternal senses uh, in terms terms of staying in the Survivor Series match. So we're finally seeing that here. The match itself doesn't get very far because partway through Jordan's knee acts up again and he leaves, he powders out. And then when that happens, Kane comes from behind and clobbers Braun with a chair and does the whole chair to the throat gimmick. And so now Braun is currently embroiled in feuds with Kane and Triple H. Like he wants to fight both of them. I guess we're gonna see more of the, I, I assumed after he put Kane through the ring that we were gonna see the end of it. Like that would be the way of the writing Kane off. Like he came back for TLC and this is a little mini feud with Braun and this is how like it's writing Kane off so he can go back to his mayoral race, but that does not seem to be the case. It seems to be still going for a while. So, and I'm just curious after this when they're going to redirect back to the Strowman Triple H program that seems to be what they're doing. Cruiserweight time as the Zoe Train, Noam Dar, Davari, Tony Nice, and Gaba Gulak take on Akira Tozawa, Mustafa Ali, Cedric Alexander, and Rich Swan. Don't you think this match would have been a better fit at Survivor Series, at least in the pre show? Makes sense in the, all the sense in the world to me. Uh, the faces win after Mustafa Ali does the reverse 450 onto Noam. Amdar. And there you go. That's your cruiserweight uh, segment for the evening. It's pretty late in the evening for an Elias segment, but there you go. Elias is singing a song about how he beat Matt Hardy the night before at Survivor Series pre-show. Then Matt comes out and beats him up and Elias powders. And I guess we're going to get more of this storyline between the two of them. I don't really know how much more they can squeeze out of it because I think Matt, I think, is kind of spinning his wheels in the creative sense with Jeff being hurt and he not being broken yet. And then you've got Elias who I, he's had some good mini feuds with like Finn Balor and Jason Jordan and Apollo Crews 
slash Titus O'Neil. So now he's doing this again now with Matt Hardy. He's basically making his way through every kind of like lower to mid card act before he finally does who knows God, God only knows what. The main event is for the IC title as The Miz defends against Roman Reigns. Great match between these two guys here. At one point, the bar try to interfere. Roman kicks out of the skull crushing finale. Seth and Dean run in to even the odds. Roman hits a spear on The Miz and pins and defeats him to become the new Intercontinental Champion. Roman is a Grand Slam champion, whether you like it or not. Let's talk about The Miz's reign for a second because he held that belt most recently for 169 days and he is still the third longest reigning champion behind Don Morocco and Pedro Morales. If he wins the belt an eighth time, which he probably will at some point, he only needs to hold it for a couple of weeks before becoming the second longest of all time. This was a really good match. I always expected The Miz would lose the Intercontinental title to some like mid-card act and the moment would be squandered. It wouldn't have as much impact. So with Roman winning it, it really it just feels right. It makes sense. You need like a big name to unseat. You know, if you're not going to build a star right now, right now there's nobody on the landscape that seems ready to take that burden, you know, give it to someone like Roman Reigns who can like carry it and, you know, make a big make it a big deal when he beats the Miz and takes the title off of him. And it seems now, I mean, I would imagine that he's going to hold on to it until Mania. So you'll have like that him with going against Brock. It'll be kind of a reminiscent of WrestleMania 6, like the Universal Champion versus the Intercontinental Champion, like unifying the titles maybe. That'd be kind of a cool marquee matchup, I would think. Uh, you know, again, you need a big name to unseat the Miz. Roman at, the, at this point is kind of like the best guy to do it. And now I hear that The Miz uh, lost, you know, this match to be taken off TV because he's going to be filming The Marine 6, which just comes right on the heels of me wrapping up Marine Month in the next couple of weeks on this channel. And so at least I'll be prepared to know about Jake Carter's backstory when The Marine 6 eventually comes out on DVD and Blu-ray. SmackDown opens up with Shane McMahon, and you know, I was joking about Stephanie this week and last, but this is on the shoot now. Just once, I would like to see a week of shows without either McMahon sibling starting things off. Uh, so he puts over SmackDown's rock after Survivor Series, calls out Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn for their deplorable actions in the main event. He's about to fire them on the spot when Daniel Bryan comes out and interrupts and puts Kevin and Sami in a match with the New Day, a lumberjack match for later in the night. And this is just more of that, you know, seemingly, you know, seem a benign conflict between Daniel and Shane, which we'll get to a little more as the show goes on. Up next, Shelton Benjamin of Benjables takes on Jay Uso of the Usos. Really good match here. Shelton wins with the Pater after a brief distraction by Chad Gable. We're getting to see more heelish tendencies, not just from Chad, but Shelton as well. And at the same time, we're seeing more face tendencies from the Usos. They're doing the Uso chant now. So really, it seems you know, less tweener and more full-fledged baby face. I was kind of like not cognizant of it. I was kind of like not believing it at first, but now it is becoming more obvious that the Usos are becoming faces once again. Backstage, we have more NXT call-ups as Ruby Riot, Liv Morgan, and Sarah Logan beat up Naomi and Becky Lynch backstage. It's not the last we'll see of them tonight, and I'll talk more about that once that segment happens. We get the official televised debut of the Bludgeon Brothers, Harper and Rowan against the Hype Bros. I do like this new gimmick of the Bludgeon Brothers. I like their ring gear. I like their music, their finisher. I'm kind of like so-so uh, about right now maybe it'll grow on me but yeah i love their look right now they're their new their new design uh they destroy the hype rose pretty early on and then uh, what happens is they have this online exclusive shot where like the hype rose are arguing again boy i can't wait for that thing to eventually blow off in 2019 so apparently we were supposed to have aj styles versus jinder mahal in a championship match on smackdown this week but that got changed uh over the course of tuesday and they announced that aj styles is going to cut a promo on jinder so he cuts the promo and he calls out jinder and you see jinder on the screen saying, I'm going to have my rematch when I want to on my terms at Clash of Champions. And then the same brother show from behind to jump AJ. They fail, and that's how the whole thing ends. So now we've got this, the match set up. The rematch is for Clash of Champions in a few weeks. So they have some time to build this up more. Let's see how they can build on that and keep it interesting. SmackDown Women's title match as Charlotte defends against Natalya in a rematch from last week. The match does not end conclusively. It ends in a big schmoz when the aforementioned NXT women, Ruby Riot, Liv Morgan, and Sarah Logan, all come out through the crowd, and Ruby Riot struggles to get over the barricade, and uh, they jump both women. And that's how the whole thing ends. So it actually, in fact, it's very eerily similar to when several months ago when Charlotte was fighting Naomi for the title and then the welcoming committee debuted. That was kind of how they, it was a very similar setup. So now over the course of Raw and SmackDown, you have six women debuting or, you know, returning in the case of Paige across both shows. And I really enjoy the fact they're establishing two new waves of like heel females across both shows coming in, making an impact right out the gate. Now there's some good and bad of this. On the one hand, like I said, it's really cool to see like the women's rosters get shaken up because I think both women divisions have 
have been kind of stale. They've been the same like six or seven women for several months. So yes, they need new blood. Now, on the one hand, the women who have been chosen to be on the main roster aren't fully seasoned. Some women need more help than others. Some women have been in NXT for a long time but underutilized. So it's kind of a mixed bag of like experience and like capabilities in the ring. Uh, but on the other hand, I'm kind of sick of the formula we're seeing on NXT where like, you know, so-and-so wrestler is there for like 100 years and then they finally go up to the title picture. They have a big emotional send-off at some takeover event and then they show up the next night on Raw or SmackDown. It's kind of an old, uh, predictable formula. And so I like to see, you know, people come up you know, earlier than expected. Even if they need a little more in-ring seasoning, again, it's on-the-job training. Clearly, there's some plan that they might have with these women, so they're going to bring them up in these different ways. So from the onset, despite the fact that I don't think every woman who's been called up is 100% ready to be on the main roster, you know, Sonya Deville and Sarah Logan immediately come to mind. I think that, you know, it's, it's, it's exciting to see this happen. Like I said, the women's rosters needed this kind of shaking up. The trick now is to find that balance between the new talent and the established talent. Main event time, a lumberjack match between Kevin and Sammy and The New Day. I totally forgot for a minute this is a rematch for the previous week when they were fighting and the new, then The Shield come down uh, before Survivor Series and Kevin and Sammy bail on The New Day. Uh, early in the night, Shane had left the arena because he put it in Daniel's hands to fire Kevin and Sammy after this match. And so that was kind of it. And then of course, Byron Saxon would not shut up about that throughout the whole match. So you just knew it wasn't going to happen. First off, it's nice to see the Colognes back on TV after who knows how long. Mike Canellis as well. Hey, Ty Dillinger, haven't seen you in a while. Eventually, after this very solid match between the two teams, the Lumberjacks begin to infight, and in the middle of all this chaos and hullabaloo, Kofi is rolled up by Sammy to uh, for the heels to win the match. Kevin bails the New Day, corner Sammy, and they beat him up, and they mock his ska dance. And then afterward backstage, Kevin confronts Daniel Bryan and like gets on his knees and begs Daniel not to fire them. And then Daniel's like, I'm not going to fire you. I've always seen potential in you. You're going to wrestle Randy Orton next week. And that's how the show ends. So they're definitely, again, sowing the seeds of dissent between Daniel Bryan and Shane McMahon. It's a power struggle. And really, isn't that what we all wanted for Daniel Bryan to eventually unretire to fight Shane McMahon? Time now for me to decide which show won for the week, Raw or SmackDown. And this week, I have to go with SmackDown once again, because looking back, I was trying to think like, well, okay, what are the pros? What are the cons? Like I do every week. And I realized I don't really have any cons for SmackDown this week. I'm not saying SmackDown was like this, wow, it's an amazing show. It was just, it was a good, solid show that didn't really have any faults with me. Really across both shows, the only thing I found objectionable besides the useless Elias Matt Hardy segment on Raw was just the fact that, you know, Sonya Deville and Mandy Rose got called up before the iconic duo. Seems kind of misplaced, but that's, a, that's kind of a nitpick and otherwise what I think is a very cool thing we're seeing across both shows with the NXT women being called up. As far as Raw goes, you know, again, the page return was really cool to see. Miz TV, Jason Jordan's budding heel antics. I, I really am looking forward to seeing where they go with Jason Jordan as a heel. Let me know what you guys thought about Raw and SmackDown this week in the comments section below, and be sure to vote which show you thought was better in the gimmick in the upper right hand corner of your screen. Be sure to thumbs up this video if you like it, subscribe to Wrestling With Regret, buy the t-shirts at ProWrestlingTees.com, and check out Patreon.com slash Wrestling With Regret for exclusive perks and some bonus content. I'm Brian Zane, and I'll see you next time.